Hello everyone and welcome to episode 11 of the Art Anglais podcast. The podcast where we talk about art, culture and society to help you learn English naturally. Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 11 of the Arte Anglais podcast. This is a podcast where I talk about all things Arte to help you learn and listen to English. So I'm your host Tara and I'm an Aussie English and art teacher from Australia. So I teach art and English together in Montpellier in France and I absolutely love my job. The two main parts of what I do are I teach kids in workshops using art as the subject area. And secondly, I make this podcast about all things arty for teenagers and adults who are intermediate learners of English. So I'm someone who is intensely motivated by art, artists and creativity. So I want to share as much as I can about everything I know with you. If you've been listening to the podcast, you know that I am also myself an artist. And I've worked as a landscape architect, so creativity has always been a big part of my life. So if this is your first time listening, welcome to the Arte Anglais podcast. Here we talk about art, culture and society and interesting subjects so that you can listen to English naturally. So here I talk about things like art, artworks, artists, different exhibitions, ones that I've been to or maybe ones that are coming up, different art styles, questions about art and I also like to talk a lot about the type of art that I'm really interested in which is urban art and urban sketching. And the reason I love these two types of art is because I feel like they are so accessible to everyone. So with urban art you can see examples of art everywhere on the streets especially here in Montpellier. And Urban sketching for me is a little bit like my therapy because I stay in one place for a long time and I focus on what's happening in the present moment and what I can see around me. So really, I just love any art that has to do with being on the streets and urban spaces. I really like meeting people when I'm doing ur urban sketching, when they come up to me and they want to have a chat to me. I really like how art can connect people. So I talk a little bit about these two loves in episode two and episode three, and I'm sure I'll probably talk about them more in future episodes as well. So if you've been listening, can you do me a little favor and just give the podcast a review on whichever platform you're listening on? Because this really helps for others who are learning English and who might be also a little bit creative and they want to learn English. So it helps them to find the podcast. Also, if you have any ideas about podcast episodes or, or things that you want to know more about, you can send me an email or a message on Instagram. Maybe you know an artist or maybe you're interested in something that you've seen or an expression that you've seen written somewhere. I'm open to anything and different ideas. So go ahead and just send me an email. So my email is info, I-N-F-O, at artionglais.com. So wherever you're listening from, I hope you're really well. Did you listen to episode 10? Did you enjoy finding out about some places in Australia? If you haven't already listened to episode 10, I suggest you do, as today we'll be continuing on a journey around Australia. And today we'll be talking about my home state in Australia, which is Victoria. And then we'll hop over to the island of Tasmania to visit some really interesting places. As I said in the last episode, it was really hard to pick my favorite places just because Australia is huge. It's so big. However, one of the places I'm talking about today, Melbourne, is in my opinion, the cultural capital of Australia. So Some people might disagree with me, especially people who live in Sydney. However, Melbourne is home to some of the most fantastic coffee 
and brunch. And brunch is that meal that you have when you want to eat breakfast and lunch in one go. So normally at about 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. And very often in Melbourne, in particular, people eat brunch on the weekend. So on a Saturday or Sunday, you'll find a lot of bustling cafes with a big line out the front of people waiting to find a table. Melbourne is also home to a very world famous street art culture. Many performing art theatres, art galleries, and also very spectacular natural scenery, especially outside of Melbourne and not very far from Melbourne either. It's also the home of Aussie rules football and it's almost time for the grand final on the 28th of September. So if you're listening to the podcast in Melbourne, I hope you'll enjoy the football fever that's coming up. And that is something we say in Melbourne a lot. When you're enjoying the football finals or the, the football culture, you're enjoying the football fever. So anyway, let's start our journey from where we left off in Canberra. So if you were to drive from Canberra to Melbourne, it would typically take you about seven hours. However, along the way, to break up the monotony, you could stop off at the two towns on the border of Victoria and New South Wales. So you could stop in Albury, which is on the New South Wales side, or you could stay in Wodonga, which is in Victoria. And both of these towns share a border with the famous Murray River, and it was of course named after George Murray. And it's Australia's longest river. So in my research for this episode, I came across the artist Chris Ellis. And at the time of writing this podcast, he was showing some of his paintings at the Mama, which is the Murray Art Museum in Albury, uh, in an exhibition called Moments of the Murray. And the display is a series of paintings which depict many different interesting views of the beautiful landscapes around the Murray River, in particular in Albury. And I really like his painting style. It reminds me a lot of the work of the Japanese artist Hokusai and also a little bit of Monet. However, what made me feel really nostalgic uh, while I was watching and looking at his work was seeing some of the beautiful reds and greens of the Australian landscape, which is something that I, it's really hard to explain in France or in Europe. That's a particular type of landscape that I really miss. So I've put a picture of Chris Ellis's art on the show notes for today's episode, and you can see some of the ways that he represents the landscapes. He uses lots of lines and dots and bright colors to represent the landscapes around the Murray River. So I lived in Albury when I first graduated from university because I was working as a landscape architect and I absolutely loved living in Albury. I used to ride to work most days and it would only take me about 20 minutes. But some days it was really scary because the magpies, which are the native birds in Australia, they're black and white native birds. They would swoop you as you rode your bike because they were trying to protect their nests. And so one day I was riding to work and I was screaming at the top of my lungs to a bird to leave me alone. And I'm pretty sure I was cursing and swearing and saying all sorts of things to this magpie. Then I fell off my bike and I rolled down the hill. And when I finally got to work, I was covered in bruises and I had scratches all over my face because I'd rolled quite a while down the hill. And somebody asked me, what happened to you? And I replied, oh, it was a magpie. And they understood exactly what I meant because magpies in Australia are very dangerous. Ask any Australian and they will tell you that magpies are very dangerous just like all the animals in Australia. 
So if I ever drove to work, it would only take me 10 minutes. And sometimes I drove because I was afraid to be swooped by these magpies. And I would only have to pass through one set of traffic lights. So it was really easy to get around in Albury. But one thing I used to love doing, in particular in summer, was floating down the Murray River on a, an inflatable boat or a canoe. And it was really easy because you could get into the river at one place called Waterworks or Munga Barina Reserve, and that was upstream. And then you would float down the river to a park close to town, which was called Noriel Park. And the good thing about the Murray River is you don't have to worry about being eaten by crocodiles when you swim. Uh, but you do have to be careful because you can get caught in a current. And a current is when the water is flowing very fast and it can pull you under the water. So you have to just make sure that you be safe in the water. You just have to make sure you go with people and, and you know where the river is going to flow to and where you will end up. So about an hour from Albury, you'll find the town of Glen Rowan. And I used to stop here every time I drove from Albury to Melbourne. Although it's not a big town, it is home to the famous bushranger, the most famous bushranger in Australia, called Ned Kelly. And he was depicted in a lot of paintings by one of Australia's best-known artists, Sidney Nolan. So Ned Kelly was kind of like a Robin Hood character, a bit of an outlaw, who was a bush ranger and stole things from people. And he had three companions and they defied police and, and the army of Victoria for a bit over two years until Ned Kelly was finally caught and then executed at the age of 25 in 1880. And the final siege or the final battle between Ned Kelly and the police of the four men occurred in the hotel in the town of Glen Rowan. So Sidney Nolan, the artist, painted many scenes in a very surrealist style because he was trying to depict the stories of Ned Kelly and his gang. And the gang is just what we refer to as the people that helped him. So Ned Kelly's gang. So his paintings, Sidney Nolan's paintings from 1946 to 1947, on the theme of Ned Kelly, I believe are probably one of the most prolific series of Australian paintings. They're the most well-known series of paintings of the 20th century. And I think it's really impressive that even though Ned Kelly wasn't a very good or a very noble person, he didn't do very nice things, but he still managed to become one of Australia's most famous persons. And Sidney Nolan's Ned Kelly series um, is currently traveling to venues across Australia until 2020. Um, it was showing recently, I think, in Albury, and then it will be going to Darwin and Cairns, I think. So when you're traveling from Albury to Melbourne, it's easy enough to drive four tedious hours on the Hume Highway, and I've done it lots of times, and believe me, it's not very fun. So there's not much to see. However, if you're feeling adventurous, you could take a little detour through some of Victoria's rural towns. And a rural town is what we call a country town or a small town. It's not a big city. So if you do, you'll be able to find some of these amazing, breathtaking and spectacular examples of Australia's world famous silo or water tank art. So you'll most likely also see kangaroos or perhaps a wombat in the fields around the country roads. So between Albury and Echuca, there are quite a few examples and places to stop of the silo art. So you could stop in Benalla, uh, and in Benalla there are over 40 different murals painted by some very well-known artists, including Adnate, who I've spoken about before, and Anthony Lister, and Kristen Brunner, who is also a tattoo artist. So these murals exist because of a festival called the Wall to Wall Festival. And the Wall to Wall Festival in Benalla is an annual street art event which brings together a combination of local, national and international artists who create these new murals in Benalla. So in 2020, the Wall to Wall Festival will 
commence. It will start on Friday the 3rd of April. So I look forward to following some of these results about the festival and seeing what happens and seeing some of these artworks that come out of it. So to track some of the work of the Silo Art Trail and the Wall to Wall Festival, you can also follow the Street Art Agency, who are also the founders of the Wall to Wall Festival and the Silo Art Trail, and it's called Juddy Roller. So follow them on Instagram or on Facebook or on their website. I put some links to it in today's show notes to help you. So if you were doing a little tour of the silos and the water tanks, you could stop at a place called Winton Wetlands where there's a water tower, or there's also the Devonish Art Silo by Cam Scale. And this is of a World War I nurse and a female military medic. And it's interesting because it shares really important message and depicts the, the role of women in the military and in society and how it's beginning to change and how much it's changed over time. So there is also the Rochester Silo, which is painted by Jimmy DeVate. And this is a possum and a kingfisher bird, which are two native animals in Australia. And I've put a picture of this particular silo in the show notes for today's episode. There's heaps more examples. There's plenty more examples in Western Victoria, including the silo art by Adnate in Sheep Hills. And I think rather than me telling you about all these examples, the best way to find out all these different silos and to find them is to use an interactive map on either the Silo Art Trail or the Australian Art Silo Map web pages. So you'll find examples of these silo arts and water tanks in every single state of Australia. And some travellers who come to Australia even try to make a road trip out of it. So they get in the car and they go to all these different silos and water tanks to see the amazing artwork. If you decided to stop in Shepparton, which is about two hours by car from Albury, you've got to check out the Moving Art Project. And it's called the Moving Art Project because it's a play on words. But what it is, is the Moving Art Project is an ever-changing public art exhibition of life-size 3D painted cows. And hence, this is why it's called the Moving Art Project. It's a really important project in Shepparton because it supports several local artists and there are over 90 cows in total and they're all painted in bright colours and they're scattered throughout Shepparton and surrounding towns in public places. So you'll find examples of cows painted like Nemo from Finding Nemo, Spider-Man, there's one dressed in an Australian flag and there's even one decorated with strawberries and cream. But why the cows? Well, the Moving Art Project pays homage to the dairy industry in Shepparton. So it honours the dairy industry, which is probably the most vital part of the economy of the town. So you can see some of the examples of the cows on the website and also the Visit Shepparton Instagram and Facebook pages. So I've put a, another picture of one of the cows on the show notes to give you an example. So finally, we arrive in Melbourne. So after arriving in Melbourne City, there are so many cultural and creative things to do. So my favorite website for finding inspiration is called The Culture Trip. And here you'll find so many ideas. For example, you might look up the best coffee in Yarraville in Melbourne or the best Thai restaurant to visit in Melbourne. There's a million different lists of things that you can find on the culture trip. So I really recommend going to that website if you if you really want to go to Melbourne. It's You can use it for places all over the world. So my favourite building in Melbourne is the Flinders Street train station. And this is a very iconic building in Melbourne. So iconic means it's very well known and that lots of people know about it in Melbourne. And so it was recently restored and repainted. So in the photos for today's show notes, it's looking very striking and, and very pretty, I think. It's the orange of the building standing out against the blue, the beautiful blue sky. 
So in Melbourne, you also have heaps of museums and galleries to choose from. So there is the Melbourne Museum, which is one of my favorite museums to visit in the, in the entire world, I think. And I particularly like the, fo the Forest Gallery, which is home to some real examples of Australia's native rainforest trees. And at the museum, you'll also find the most informative Aboriginal cultural centre, and it's called the Birrung Gallery at Bunjalika Aboriginal Cultural Centre. And I hope I've pronounced that correctly. If I haven't, please tell me. So at Bunjalika Aboriginal Cultural Centre, you'll have the opportunity to get a bit of an insight into the lives of Victorian Indigenous people. So the most incredible feature piece of the gallery is called Warika, and it contains 74 panels of etched designs and it goes along a wall and they each reflect imagery from Aboriginal heritage and landscapes of Victoria. So it's a very important piece. It's a very important gallery to go and see in Melbourne. So the Biron Gallery hosts three exhibitions a year as part of the community art program. And it ranges from things like photography, sculpture and works on canvas to digital media and installation. So anytime anyone asks me about where they should go in Melbourne, I always tell them that they should go to the, to the Melbourne Museum and they should go to the Cultural Centre. So the most well-known of the arts precinct in Melbourne are the Arts Centre and the National Gallery of Victoria, which are both located in Southbank. Then you have the Ian Potter Centre, which is located at Federation Square. And at the National Gallery of Victoria, I've seen really amazing exhibitions, actually, including uh, I recently saw, or two years ago now, Vincent van Gogh and the Seasons. And I also saw a really great exhibition of Hokusai. And the National Gallery is where I was also introduced to the artist, Alexandra Kahagalogu, and I really hope I've pronounced that right too. It's a very difficult name. She's an Argentinian artist who makes handmade rugs and tapestries of landscape scenes. And in the show notes for today's episode, you'll see a picture of Will Smith, and he's lying on one of her tapestry rugs, and he's taking a selfie of himself in the mirror, which is above the rug. So it's a really interesting way of representing art. And I had the pleasure of being able to take a selfie of myself on one of these, but I couldn't find a picture for today's episode notes. Anyway, something Melbourne is also well known for is its urban art. So graffiti and street art. And I think it's essential at this point to make the distinction here and say that, well, urban art includes both mural, murals or street art and graffiti. So after doing a few different tours, I've realized I'm sometimes the first to make a mistake of referring to urban art as street art. And when I do that, it means I'm leaving out an essential part of the urban art culture. And that is the graffiti artist. I once did a street art tour in Berlin and it was done by a graffiti artist. And he really made a point to tell me that it's urban art. It's not street art, not the graffiti and the, the street art are two different things. They're two different cultures. And he really made a point to me, and I wanted to emphasize that in this episode. So we'll talk more about that distinction and the history in a later episode and what it exactly means and what exactly it means in the world of urban art. One thing I did a few years ago was to be a tourist in my own city, and I really recommend doing this in your own city because you find out things about your city that you didn't know existed. And so I did this urban art tour with Blender Art Studios and the tour was excellent because it was given by a local artist who goes by the name of Junkie Projects. And in a similar way to another of my favorite artists, Bordalo, Junkie uses pieces of the rubbish that we throw away and he turns them into fabulous art and he puts them up on parts of the street in ways that you wouldn't even know are there. So it's very subtle, but very interesting to see when you find them. 
So check out his stuff. I've put a link to his website in the show notes. And have a look what he does because it's really hard to explain what he does because every piece is so different and really cool and very clever. So as a local artist, he was able to give me a good insight into the urban art scene in Melbourne and explain the different regions of street art. So in Melbourne, the street art doesn't just exist in the main city of Melbourne. In fact, I think a lot of street artists are moving away from the centre of Melbourne, but it exists in many suburbs throughout Melbourne, including St Kilda, Brunswick, Fitzroy, Collingwood, even in Yarraville, where I used to live, and many, many other suburbs. So you can learn more about the different regions on many blog articles, and of course you can do a Blender Studios tour, and you'll find out more on one of their tours. And I think doing one of the tours is also a really excellent way to explore some of the lanes and arcades in Melbourne, like the Grave Street, Hosier Lane, Hardware Lane, and ACDC Lane. And you'll especially love ACDC Lane if you love David Bowie. So the arcades and the laneways in Melbourne are a very important part of the Melbourne culture. And the street art and the graffiti are both important aspects of that culture. The other great thing I found about doing the tour was I was able to visit the studio at the end. And by doing that, I was able to also see some of the incredible artwork which is being produced by the artists. So Blender Studios is a self-sustaining project that puts the artists first and it funds itself through social enterprises, creating And then it means it creates one of the cheapest studio spaces in town and it allows the artists to be able to create the amazing artworks that they make. So at the Blender, there is a very high caliber of hardworking artists across lots of different mediums. And when I say high caliber, I mean they're very highly skilled artists. So about 80% of the artists at Blender make a living off their art through sales, gallery shows, workshops, various projects, and the Melbourne Street Art Tours. So for me, it was a really important way to be able to get to know what some of the artists are doing and to also engage and and find out about how I can buy some of their work as well. So I learned some really fantastic things from Blender Studios on the tour I did and from reading on their website and and asking the tour guide some questions. And you will have the same opportunity if you do it also. So some of the things I learned were really important, I think, to get an understanding of the culture. So in 2004, a few things happened that changed the Melbourne street art movement forever, the Melbourne urban art movement. And the first was the preparations for the Commonwealth Games. So in 2006, the Commonwealth Games were in Melbourne. And this meant that the government and the city of Melbourne changed its graffiti policy. So they set up this police task force and they they had to try and stop graffiti. And a big section of influential urban art was painted over. And some of the most prolific artists who were painting at the time went on the run and they're still on the run today, still creating street art. So on the run just means they were hiding from the police and the law. And I think the interesting thing that we talked about on the tour was how the council makes the decision about which street artists to commission to do work. But on the other hand, they still paint over other street artists if they don't like it. So I guess as an artist, that could be really disappointing and frustrating. So unless you are a well-known artist, your art might not stay on the walls for long. But I think as an urban artist, you probably also know that that's part of the culture. So Hosier Lane is a great example of this because it changes so much from week to week. And the the paint on the walls is so thick. You can see little pieces of the paint chipping off the wall. And it's so thick that Junkie Projects, the tour guide for my tour, makes colourful jewellery out of the pieces of paint that chip off the walls. So as you can see, you learn a lot from one of these tours, and I highly recommend doing them. 
You could also do a tour on your own by using the City of Melbourne suggested guide. There's a suggested guide on their website. However, I think you'll have a much more enjoyable visit if you do it with an urban artist because you'll have an opportunity to ask the questions and also see the art studios and some of the urban artists working. I've put a lot of photos from my time on the tour in the show notes for today's episode, but it was so long ago now that I can't even be sure if these artworks are still there. But this is why, to me, urban art is just so amazing. It's so fleeting and it's always changing. So I look forward to visiting Melbourne again soon so I can see some of the new pieces of art. And there's one particular piece of art that I really want to see, which is an interesting silo that was painted this year in Brunswick. And it was painted by Loretta Lizio, and it's a mural of the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, embracing a Muslim woman. And this is a memorial to the 51 victims who were killed when a terrorist stormed two mosques in Christchurch in March and opened fire on the congregation. So the artist says that she and the organisers of the project are just doing our best to inspire peace, love, hope and acceptance in any way we can. So I really look forward to seeing that mural and I've put a picture of it in today's episode notes. I think it's a really beautiful piece of art. Another place, another interesting place to visit in Melbourne is Birong Ma and this is next to Federation Square and the Yarra River. And it's called Birong Ma because it's the name given by the Wurundjeri people and they were the indigenous inhabitants at the time of European settlement of the Melbourne area. So it is home to some critical sculptural artworks, including a semicircle of metal shields. And each of these metal shields represents one of the five of the Kulin Nations, which is a collection of Aboriginal Indigenous Australian tribes from the southern states in Australia. Birung Ma also includes Deborah Halpin's two-headed angel sculpture and a pedestrian bridge which leads directly to the Melbourne Cricket Ground, or the MCG. And this is the home of Australian rules football, of Aussie rules football. So if you come to Melbourne in September, you'll be really lucky to see the football. And the grand final is always in Melbourne, and the day before is the grand final parade. It's so special to Melbourne that we even have a public holiday for the grand final parade. Next thing I wanted to talk about is shopping, but I'm not going to talk much about shopping because it's not really my favorite thing, but I wanted to mention a few little shops and stops that you could make. Of course, you can visit Melbourne Central, which is a shopping center, and you could take a photo of the shop tower. The Melbourne Central shop tower is the most photographed place in Melbourne, and when you see the picture in the show notes, you'll understand why. I think I have taken a picture of this shop tower a hundred times. Every day I used to take a picture on my way to university. But don't forget to visit some of the little shops too. So the first one I want to mention is a little shop called Melbournealia and it's a, a shop where everything is made in Melbourne by local designers and artists and it's at the top of Burke Street close to Parliament House. You also We'll find lots more arty shops on Smith Street and Gertrude Street, including the Melbourne shop and Happy Valley, which is on Smith Street in Collingwood. Melbourne also has a lot of different small or hidden galleries. So one of them is called Blindside, and it's a not-for-profit artist-run art space. And interestingly, the name Blindside is an idiom. So if you blindside someone, it means you are startling them or surprising someone with a piece of information or with something interesting. So the gallery says it is therefore a place where you can expect the unexpected. A new gallery called Finkelstein Gallery just opened in Melbourne too and this is Australia's first ever female only gallery. So the gallery is showing the work of many female artists including one artist that I'm really interested in, Louise Paramore who is well known for large scale public art commissions and they're often very brightly colored objects. There's also a little hidden gallery called Dirty Dozen and it's a mini gallery underneath the Flinders Street train station in the Campbell Arcade. 
So one of Campbell Arcade's defining features is it has a series of glass cabinets which have housed artworks by local artists since 1994. And it was previously run by a not-for-profit organisation called Platform Artist Group Incorporated. And then it was recently renamed the Dirty Dozen. So every year, artists can apply to have their work displayed in, in the mini gallery. And people can see it every day when they walk past on their daily commute. And speaking of commuting and trams, Melbourne is also home to well-known trams. And I've talked about the tram art and the tram art project in Melbourne in episode six. So you can find out more about that project and the Melbourne street artist Russ Kidd if you listen to that episode. Just outside of Melbourne, of the main part of the city, there are also some very cool suburbs and you could even stay in these suburbs on a visit to Melbourne because they are not far from the city and they're even a little bit cheaper. So there's Yarraville, Northcote, Brunswick, Hawthorne, Brunswick East, just to name a few. But there's a lot of little inner suburbs in the city of Melbourne that you could stay in. So about two hours from Melbourne by train, you have the city of Bendigo. And this was once home to the gold rush in Victoria. And from an art perspective, it's also home to the Bendigo Art Gallery. So the Bendigo Art Gallery is the largest and one of the oldest regional galleries in Australia. So the gallery has a really big and extensive collection of 19th century European art and also Australian art. I think it's also interesting because Bendigo is home to a very expanding and growing street art culture because many murals are being commissioned by the city of Bendigo each year. A little over two hours from Bendigo, you have the Grampians and this place is for adventure enthusiasts from all over the world and many of them come for abseiling, rock climbing, bushwalking and cycling. And a lot of people find themselves to be awestruck by the wildlife, the native plants and the wildflowers that you can find in the Australian bush. So a lot of people, when they go to the Grampians, they stay in Halls Gap. Or there's also many camping sites in and around the, the Grampians National Park. You could make a road trip out of visiting the Grampians and also the Great Ocean Road and do it all in one go. And so when we say road trip, what I mean is to make a really long journey by car. So the Great Ocean Road is the scenic driveway between Torquay and Allensford and it's 243 kilometers long. And in between you have incredible, amazing scenery and beaches. So the road travels via lots of little coastal towns, including Anglesey, Lawn, uh, Apollo Bay, and Port Campbell. So Port Campbell is where you will find some natural limestone and sandstone rock formations. And these include the 12 apostles. Even though they're called the 12 apostles, there's only eight of them left. There's the Lockhart Gorge, there's also the Grotto, and the London Arch. Now the Arch, was formerly known as London Bridge, but in 1991, it unexpectedly collapsed on the 15th of January in 1990. When this happened, it left two tourists stranded in the middle of the rock formations, but then they were rescued by a helicopter a little while later, and thankfully, no one was injured in the process. On the Great Ocean Road, along the way, you'll also find the Cape Otway Lighthouse and the National Park, which deviates a little bit off the road. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you might even see a koala sitting high in the eucalyptus trees. The expression keeping your eyes peeled is a really useful expression. And you can use it when you mean to tell someone to be on the, on the alert and to watch carefully or vigilantly for something. And this is an expression I'm sure many tourists use in Australia when they are on the lookout for all of our native wildlife. So next time you're in Australia, make sure you keep your eyes peeled. Between the Great Ocean Road and Melbourne, you could also stop at some of the beach towns like Bells Beach, Torquay or Ocean Grove for some good old fashioned Aussie surfing. So Bells Beach, is the home of the world's longest continuously running pro surfing competition. And this is known as the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. 
And in April this year, the beach recorded waves between three and five metres. And they were breaking on the shoreline. So they had to be closed because it was such a dangerous condition for surfing. So you could also make a stop in Geelong to visit the city, which I sometimes feel like is a mini version of Melbourne. And in Geelong, scattered along the waterfront are the Baywalk bollards. And they're these large, colourful sculptures which capture and show some of the city's histories. I put some pictures in today's show notes to so that you can see what they look like and it's a picture of some lifesavers. There is also something really interesting to me which I've not seen before but I would like to go and see and it's called the Powerhouse Museum. So the Powerhouse Geelong is a very interesting project and an industrial street art space. It's located in North Geelong and it's an old abandoned power station which has been empty for 45 years now. And now thanks to the Powerhouse Museum, the art space includes a 3,000 square meter building and it sits on six acres of land and it's Australia's largest street art gallery. And the curator of this exciting project is Ian Ballas. So over 220 artists so far, and it could be more, have transformed the derelict power station into a very vibrant arts precinct. And so a lot of the pictures that I've been seeing of it look really amazing and I'd really like to go and see it. And they also do workshops and classes and recently they seem to have renovated the space. So I'm hoping to pay them a visit in November when I'm in Melbourne. On the other side of Melbourne, around the Port Phillip Bay, on the other side to Geelong, is the Mornington Peninsula. And this is home to many wineries, art studios, and art galleries. There are also little towns like Mornington, which are really lovely for day trips. And it's also home to the Peninsula Hot Springs, a place where you can go if you want a day to just relax in the spa. And it's not too far from a favorite place of mine to eat called Green Olive at Red Hill. And here you can enjoy a meal made from fresh ingredients that were grown on the farm, in the garden, in the farm. And the garden is just next to the restaurant. The last place I'm going to mention in Victoria is Wilson's Promontory. And this is known to us Aussies as just Wilson's Prom or the Prom. And this is something you'll have to get used to in Australia if you're in Australia. Every place in Australia has a nickname. For example, the Prom. Federation Square in Melbourne is just Fed Square. And the Melbourne Cricket Ground, or the MCG, has been shortened to only the G. And it makes me feel like, gosh, learning English in Australia must be so hard. Anyway, on the way to Wilson's Prom, there is a little island called Phillip Island. And the most popular tourist attraction on this small island is called the Penguin Parade. Uh, Every night when the sun goes down, hundreds of people come to see the penguins the fairy penguins who return from the ocean to find their nest at night. And this is hands down, meaning it's the best tourist activity I have ever done. It blew me away to see all the penguins running up the beach in small little groups to find their nests. So if you're going to Melbourne, I really suggest making the day trip to the penguin parade and staying overnight and doing a small tour of some of the places on Phillip Island because There are some really beautiful beaches, some excellent surfing, and also a little chocolate factory. And there's a sculpture of a little chocolate penguin, or it's a big chocolate penguin that you could see. So Wilson's Prom is a national park, and also it's the southernmost part of Victoria, and also the southernmost part of the mainland of Australia. You can camp in the park at Wilson's Prom in designated camping spots or stay in cabins. So the most popular camping spot is a place called Tidal River. And you could also do some of the most amazing walks and stay overnight in some of the the hiking campsites. And so you can do trails around Wilson's Prom overnight. There's lots of different hiking campsites that you could stay in. There's also a lot of Australian wildlife at Wilson's Prom. So on the times that I've been, I've seen kangaroos and wallabies. And the wallabies look a bit like a kangaroo, but they are much smaller. I've also seen wombats, echidnas, and emus while I've been driving in the car. 
And my favorite beach on Wilson's Prom is Squeaky Beach. And do you know why it's called that? Well, because when you walk on the sand, the sand makes a squeaking noise. Very clever name for this beach. Anyway, the last thing you should do is on your way back from Wilson's Prom, try and make a stop in a little town called Fish Creek to see the Celia Rossa Art Gallery. So she is a botanical illustrator in Australia who draws plants and paints plants in watercolors. But the cool thing about Celia Rossa is she has dedicated her entire life to painting the whole genus of Banksia. So when I say genus of Banksia, what I mean is she's painted every single different species of Banksia. And it's a species of plant found in Australia and she's the only artist to have ever painted all of the all of the Banksia species. Now that I've talked so much about Victoria and Melbourne, let's hear a little bit about some of the places I've been in Tasmania. So the first time I went to Tasmania was not long ago. So I couldn't possibly do it justice, but I've only been once. However, I'll talk about my time in Hobart. So Hobart is a beautiful little city in Tasmania. It's much colder than Melbourne. In Hobart, I did three things that I enjoyed. First, I did a self-guided walking tour of the city of Hobart to find some of the Art Walls murals. And this is a project that was commissioned by the city of Hobart to deter illegal graffiti. These were all fascinating murals and I managed to find all of them. However, what's interesting is there is still a thriving urban art culture in Hobart too, despite the city council trying to deter the artists. You need to sometimes venture a little further out and explore some of the laneways. So I used a guide from the University of Tasmania that I found on the internet to help me. And one of my favorite places was Biddencopes Lane. And this is a bit of a hotspot for street art and urban art, thanks to two festivals. One, the Vibrance Vibrance Festival and Dark Mofo. And the second thing I did, which I loved, was to visit Mount Wellington. And wow, what a view. I took so many photos and I was freezing, absolutely freezing. It's really cold on the top of Mount Wellington. And the last thing I love doing in Hobart is something I'm sure many tourists do too in Hobart. And it was a visit to Mona, the Museum of Old and New Art. It is a museum which is privately owned by David Walsh. And it has a strong focus on things that shock. So he goes for shock value. Most of the pieces are not what you would traditionally see in a gallery such as the Louvre. So you can get to the museum by a ferry and the ferry is painted in a camouflage paint and it contains some exciting graffiti and sculptures of, of sheep. So at the museum, the artwork I was most fascinated by was the digital artwork of Falling Water and it's called Bitfall by Julius Pop. And I also really enjoyed the installation entitled 2050 and this was by Richard Wilson. And what it is, is a room filled to waist height with recycled engine oil and the surface of the oil mirrors the architecture of the room. A, a little walkway extends from the entrance and it leads the viewer into a room until you are surrounded by oil on three sides. And you can get some really interesting reflections and photos when you're standing up next to the oil. There are so many other interesting, bizarre and profoundly shocking pieces that you can find if you visit Mona. But don't forget to see if you can find some of the smaller art galleries and local artists around Hobart too. So I found the Tasmania Arts Guide to be an excellent place to start. And I used when I used this, I found a gallery here called The World of Marbles and also a guide on where to find public art and artists based in Tasmania. So you'll also be able to meet some of the local artists at the Salamanca Market each Saturday and it goes from 8.30 till 3 p.m. So at the market, you'll find arts, crafts, jewelry, fresh food and produce, collectibles and homewares, and you can talk to, um, to some of the local artisans who make the products. Now that I've spoken so much, that's all for me today. I'm feeling very nostalgic, very much like I'm missing Australia, but I'm happy to have shared some of my favorite places with you. 
And next time we'll talk about some of the states and places in Australia I haven't spent a lot of time in. So it will be a learning experience for all of us. The last time I went to Northern Territory, I think I was about 16. So this is a long time ago. So sometimes I feel like people who come to Australia have seen more of it than me. Anyway, we'll go to South Australia, we'll go to Northern Territory and Western Australia, and we'll find out more about Indigenous art and artists in Australia. So I really look forward to sharing this next episode with you. Until next time, I'll catch you later.